All right. Uh, howdy, everybody. My name is Andrew Butterfield, but you can just call me Butters, because that's what everybody else at Instructure does. And I'm Brad Humphrey. I'm passionate about uh, giving you the power to make Canvas into the application that you need for your specific institution. Um, so we're excited to talk about some of those platform technologies today. Yeah, and we're uh, both engineers uh, on the platform team. And you've been in with Instructure for like five years, right? Yeah. And I've been for three. So anyway, cool. All right, well, let's get started. Welcome to what can be built on the Canvas platform. Is this working? Nope. <laughs> There we go. All right, cool. Uh, OK, so from the very beginning, when Canvas, or sorry, when Instructure open sourced the code for Canvas, uh, it's really been about as open as a company can be. And uh, we really sought to empower our users to do great things. We want teachers to be able to teach better, and we want students to be able to learn better, and we want parents to be able to engage in that process in a meaningful way. And so from this perspective, building a platform that allows all of you to extend Canvas in meaningful ways to solve the problems that you face every day seemed like a no-brainer in accomplishing uh, our goal to help everyone learn and grow uh, smarter, uh, or in the smartest way possible. So that being said, uh, there's some other reasons why we decided to build a platform. And one of those is that uh, we don't always have the best ideas. I mean, like there's lots of great ideas out there, and we don't have a monopoly on, on good ideas. And actually, many of the features that are in Canvas have come from, from you guys, from our community, for which we're super grateful. Um, and we also don't have enough time or resources to implement all of the amazing ideas out there. And it's always fun for us to see, uh, I guess, how each of you personalize Canvas to solve the problems that your institutions face. Uh, so today, we're going to uh, talk about the various components that make up the Canvas platform. And in prior years, that discussion has centered around the API and the LT, uh, LTI uh, components of, of our platform. But today, we have a couple new arrivals. And some of you may have already heard of some of these. But one is Caliper Live Events, and the other is Canvas Data. Um, so we're pretty excited to talk about those. Um, our hope is that uh, you leave today knowing what's possible and inspired to build what nobody else has. One just little data point that we went through really quick just before our presentation. Uh, about 20% of all of the presentations that have been given at this Instructure Con have focused on, or not focused, but at least touched on uh, the API, LTI, Canvas data, and Canvas Live events. So I think that's pretty significant um, and, and shows that our, our platform is pretty mature and, and being used in a lot of cool ways by, by all of you. So thank you. Um, OK, so let's get into the first part of our platform, which is the API. Um, Canvas exposes what's called a REST API, or RESTful API. And REST stands for represent, representational state transfer. Uh, we're not going to get into like, the nitty gritty details of everything associated with REST. But the gist of what you need to understand is this. Essentially, a REST API allows you to manage resources over a network via HTTP requests. And it allows you to manage resources using what we commonly refer to as the CRUD operation. So you can create new resources. You can read individual and collections of resources. You can update resources. And you can destroy or delete resources. Um, so what kind of resources are we talking about? The Canvas API exposes about 90 uh, resources that you can manage. Um, and I'm sure all of you are wondering, is this an accurate representation of API usage uh, and managing these resources. So let me tell you how I derived this information. Um, about three weeks ago, I looked at a week's worth of API activity. And uh, unfortunately, because of the way that I had to get this data, I can't like partition it based on API requests made from like mobile devices and then like LTI tools and then the Canvas front end because the Canvas front end actually uh, makes a significant amount of API requests. So all of that's kind of lumped in to this. But I think that this still reflects uh, how those access patterns would work for each of those kind of vertical slices of API access. And so there it is. Like courses is the most commonly accessed resource. And I think, 
I mean, if you think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? Because whatever you do in Canvas, almost always it happens in the context of a course. Um, so I look at this word cloud, and I see loads of opportunity, right? Like, some of these resources are smaller because they're not accessed as frequently. And maybe that's because nobody's built a really cool tool um, that kind of extends the Canvas UI or creates an external user experience that um, Canvas just can't provide right now. So I'd encourage you to jump in there and you know, figure out something cool that would benefit your users that you could build. So we're going to go through uh, actually a number of case studies with each of these uh, kind of platform areas. And uh, before I get into that, I, I wanted to explain like what kinds of applications can be built on the API. And so here you can see like you can make native, native desktop applications, you can make mobile applications, you can make web applications that are external to Canvas or internal as well. And uh, Brad's going to talk about how you can kind of inject your application into Canvas. Um, but all of these are, are going to, uh, all of these can be built on top of the Canvas API. And, and paramount to all of those requests is security. And so let me kind of explain how API security works, because we don't want just anybody to be able to make API requests kind of willy-nilly and mess with your data, right? They should only be able to mess with the data that they have access to. So uh, when you build an application on top of the API, the very first thing that you're going to do is take the user through, <coughs> excuse me, an authentication process. And at the end of that process, you're going to receive a token uh, that allows you to make API requests, that allows the application to make API requests on behalf of that user. Uh, when a, an API request comes into Canvas, we look at that token, and that token allows us to do a number of things. It allows us to identify uh, the user that's behind that request, that they're authenticated, and then it allows us to authorize what resources they have access to. So this allows us to kind of prevent uh, a student, for example, from using their token to change grades in the gradebook, right? We wouldn't want that to happen. Um, so that's kind of the security layer that's on top of API, uh, our API. Let's get into an example that uh, some of you, or hopefully all of you, were able to hear about yesterday, which, is, which was in uh, the keynote about Canvas Teacher, the new mobile app that we just released. And we're going to go through a very specific use case, and that's that a teacher wants to be able to grade an assignment. And so I'm going to kind of show you the API requests that the application makes, and hopefully this will be a pattern that you, know, you can follow or leverage in building an application yourself. So all the sides are going to kind of look like this. I'll show you the view inside of Canvas Teacher, and then the endpoint that it's, uh, that it's hitting on the Canvas API, and then just like the initial JSON data that's coming back from the API, because there just isn't room to show it all. Um, and JSON data is really just textual information, right? You kind of have these key value pairs um, that are coming back from the server. So like I said, with courses being the most frequently accessed resource via the Canva Canvas API, the initial view in Canvas Teacher is a view of the courses that the teacher you know, is enrolled in. And so you, the teacher would pick a course, and then Canvas Teacher makes another request to get all the assignments uh, for that course. And I'm not going to show all the API requests that are necessary uh, for each of these views, but you can see here that it also organizes things according to assignment group. So you'd have to make another API request to get the assignment group information to render this view. Um, but this is kind of the next step uh, in, in building this application. Once the teacher has a list of assignments, they're going to choose one that they want to grade. And that's going to require another API request to Canvas to get back the details for that assignment. Um, I am going to focus on one other API request that's used to generate this view. And that's for this little section down at the bottom uh, where you see kind of these little graphs. Now, I think the thing that's cool about applications that are built on top of an API is that you can, I mean, the information you get back is pretty boring, right? Like, it's just textual information. Um, but the cool thing about building an application on top of it is that you can really dress it up. And this is one opportunity uh, that we've done, or taken, I guess, in Canvas Teacher. So you have like these little graphs that give you kind of an instant idea of how many things have been graded, how many things you need to grade still, and then how many students haven't yet submitted for that particular assignment. And when you, uh, and we actually created this API endpoint just for the teacher app application, and we're constantly adding new endpoints to our API. So if you have a need, uh, please talk with us, because 
we like adding more endpoints to our API to help you guys solve the problems that you need to. Um, but anyway, from this point, a teacher would either slide over that submissions point or they could uh, tap on one of those graphs um, because we can filter the submissions here. Um, and then they would pick a, a submission that they haven't yet graded. And that would give them a signed uh, endpoint that they can hit that would take them to the new doc viewer uh, that we've built that was announced yesterday as well. And then in here, we have basically all of the functionality that you have in SpeedGrader, but all on a mobile device. So as a teacher, you know, you can just grade those things on the go when you have time and not have to just sit down in front of a computer to be able to do that. So this is just one example of how you can use the API to uh, create a useful tool for the different kinds of users that we have. And, and uh, I don't want to like, I guess, limit your view to just mobile applications, right? Like we have the iOS app and the Android app, but uh, really you could build uh, an application on top of the Canvas API using any framework that you wanted to. So if you wanted to do a native desktop, app, desktop application with Electron or uh, Adobe Air or, or some other framework that you're familiar with, really all you need is a framework that uh, gives you a web view. Uh, because the web view is necessary to do that authentication process that gives you the token that you use to then make requests on behalf of the user that's using your application. So anyway, kind of cool. Um, I'm going to turn the time over to Brad to talk about LTI. All right. So LTI, embedded integrations. Um, I've been kind of using the, recently I've been using this metaphor of a window in Canvas. LTI gives you the ability to kind of stick stuff outside of your house, outside of your Canvas instance that you can see and use and interact with. So LTI is a great standard that has allowed us to maintain our you know, cloud software status as a company where everyone's running the same, ver everyone's running the same version of Canvas, um, but still allows you to uh, customize and, uh, and make specific enhancements and benefits for your users. Um, Canvas has a lot of these windows throughout its system, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, under the hood, Canvas, or LTI uses iframes to constrain third-party external tools to a certain area of the page. This is good because it'll, it allows us to say, hey, you've got this sandbox you can play in. Um, it looks really integrated with Canvas, uh, but it also doesn't allow a third-party external tool to take over or um, uh, compromise the security of Canvas. Um, LTI also provides single sign-on. Uh, one of the one big benefits of, of LTI is once you've got that LTI relationship set up, you can use that to sign into another app. In fact, I've imagined applications that just implemented LTI as a mechanism. They could redirect to a Canvas LTI launch page and then have single sign-on into their app. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of really good benefits to LTI. Um, basically, how LTI works is you have, a, a, as a user, you authenticate with Canvas. Canvas says, okay, I know who you are. You request a resource that is an LTI resource. And Canvas gives your browser the information it needs to authenticate and interact with that third-party resource. Uh, here's an example of a few of these windows in Canvas. Um, here are some ones that we use, have used frequently or have used recently. Course navigation is a very common one. You get at a, you get at a navigation link to the left-hand side in your courses. You can also do this in accounts. And when, when clicked, the user, the main content frame becomes your external tools content. Uh, homework submission, um, this is an example of a, of a content, content selector for homework submission specifically. This allows a student to select items from any external service to be submitted for their homework. Uh, this is also used to embed content in the RCE or to you know, create new module items or embed content in pages. Um, and then this third one is new. Similarity detection is uh, a new placement that we have that allows a tool provider to actually embed content in the creation of, a, of an assignment. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but hook into that assignment workflow and life cycle so that they can interact with uh, students as they interact with their assignments in Canvas. Um, there's a lot of placements. Uh, on this screen, I've listed 23. These are the official placements in Canvas. Um, different places you can put things. There are other ways to get content into Canvas here. A big one, a big new one that actually isn't on this screen is uh, you can embed LTI links from your application in SpeedGrader now. So uh, the students can, uh, the students and teachers can interact with content um, 
they can take assignments and then, and then those assignments can uh, return content to SpeedGrader and the LTI tool can then render um, results data and, and analytics to teachers and students about you know, how they did on those assessments. Um, but there's lots of other places that, that LTI links can get, can get embedded as well. But I mean, the point of this slide is there's a lot of places that you can do things. We're constantly adding more of these. Um, every time someone has a use case where they're like, I need to do X, Y, Z, I need to extend this, I need to do that, um, we're like, great, let's add a placement. And it's pretty easy at this point. We've gotten pretty good at it. So um, continue to look for those. Like the dashboard? No, in a course. So, so there's all these, so if I replace the, the module or whatever, the first thing students see. So, yes. So the question, the question was, can you embed a, can you embed an external tool on the landing page for a course? Yes. Um, yes, because you can set the landing page to a course to be a rich content page, and you can have the content of that page be an LTI launch. So, yes, that is possible. Um, all right, LTI is a standard. Uh, we like standards at Instructure. Um, there's a few reasons why having LTI be a standard is valuable. One, it, it lets us work with a larger community in determining how we should do these things. Um, it, one of my favorite things is that it makes it a lot cheaper for partners of Instructure to focus on building rich applications instead of focusing on how they're going to integrate with each LMS. It provides a common framework, and you know it's not perfect. They still have to customize generally for each LMS, but it does give them a common framework and a common language and um, good methodologies that allow them to jump in more quickly and then spend more time focusing on providing you guys a good experience. Um, standards also create a larger community support community for you. If you are building integrations, uh, you can now go to the bigger LTI community and look for things like libraries that will help you do the authentication pieces and the more difficult pieces. Um, and that stuff is built in a lot of languages because LTI is part of a big community. If this was a just Canvas thing, we'd probably have a Ruby library, maybe a JavaScript library, and that'd be it. But there's more than that because it's a larger community. Um, and then standards for us in, in our history at Instructure have always been something that we've looked at as a jumping off point or a starting place for rich integrations. Um, standards bodies can move a little bit slower than we're generally satisfied with, and so we, we work with them and move as quickly as we can with them, but then we're willing to kind of iterate and, and innovate uh, on top of those standards, and it provides a good place to start. So standards are great, and we love them. Um, uh, the case study we want to do here was the Google Drive LTI tool. Um, so you can see here, this is a course navigation placement. All of the content besides the navigation is rendered by an LTI tool that we built. Uh, and that LTI tool goes and gets your Google documents and renders them for you. You can view them from here. Um, just a convenient way to get in and view your documents. Uh, collaborations, an upgrade we did, um, allows LTI tools to be the primary form of collaboration, which makes a lot of sense, because when you're creating collaboration, you're creating it to collaborate on documents often that are outside of the scope of Canvas. Um, this, is, this is an example of where an LTI tool is using uh, OAuth and our APIs to achieve a richer integration. The LTI tool itself is actually rendering that student list, the, those enrollments, and they're get, it's getting that information through the LTI membership service um, and through, OAuth, for, through our OAuth uh, authorization. So um, another great example of, of LTI. Um, here's that resource selection screen again. In this case, this is a teacher creating assignment, an assignment. Um, this is going to be a cloud assignment. So the teacher is selecting a document that the LTI tool will then copy to each student in the course. The students in the course will then be able to um, make changes to that uh, base document and submit a copy for grading. So you can see here a student view of that same document once it's been selected. This is their personal copy of the document. They can view it, they can edit it, and then they can submit it uh, for grading. And when they click that Submit button, we actually have, this is kind of a cool integration because this is using DocViewer, our new service, uh, with the Google LTI tool. Um, basically what happens is Google will submit that document, we get it converted to a PDF, and then we feed that into our DocViewer service where it can be annotated just like any other document that a student submits. So it provides a really nice seamless experience for teachers grading. 
All right, LTI2, I know many of you have heard of it. It's been around for a little while. Um, we've been working with IMS uh, in LTI2 because it brings, us, it brings us some benefits and it makes it so that we can have more powerful, more robust integrations with tools. Um, LTI2 is uh, polishing up the standard a little bit. Uh, it, it does make it a little bit more complex for tool providers, but it provides some simplicity for users and it actually gives us a lot of really cool benefits. Um, and here's a few of those. Uh, because LTI1 is tied to the OAuth1 standard, the OAuth1 standard is a little antiquated, and this allows us to move on in a lot of ways to newer technologies. Um, we get some better security. We can enforce a little bit better the a security contract between a tool and and the tool uh, between a tool provider and the tool consumer canvas. Uh, we can use better hashing algorithms that are a little bit safer. Um, there's some standardization around the APIs. We get to use more modern uh, frameworks for accessing APIs. Uh, IMS is working through providing some standard sets of APIs that tool providers can use. Once again, this is laying that framework to make it easier for people who are building tools for many LMSs to focus more on providing value and less on how do I integrate with this system. Uh, and there's new services that are coming out and, and will provide some of that, that value. Um, and then, you know, some, some improved interface experiences, registrations, and improved user flow where a teacher no longer has to know things like what's my key in secret that happens a little bit more behind the scenes. All right, we'll now talk about Caliper Live Event. Cool, okay. So I'm gonna focus on the live event part of this first and then I'll talk about what the Caliper portion is uh, just in a little bit. Um, okay, oh, wrong button, upside down. Okay, all right. So uh, I want to paraphrase uh, Charles Darwin. So it's not the, the strongest of applications that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And prior to live events, if an application, a third party application, wanted to know if information had changed in Canvas, the only mechanism to do that is referred to as polling. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with polling, I think the quintessential example of polling is you're on a road trip with your kids. And they're in the back seat and they're constantly asking, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet, right? And uh, I don't know, some of those times for me, I wish I'd had you know, a little enforcement there that could help. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's the example of polling. And third party applications would do kind of a similar thing for Canvas, right? So let's say that there's some piece of data that they're interested in, maybe it's submissions, for example and a third party application at some regular interval, maybe it's depending on the use case, every 10 minutes, every hour, every day, um, would be asking Canvas, hey, are there new submissions yet? Are there new submissions yet? Are there new submissions yet? And that requires time and processing power and resources for the third party application, as well as Canvas. And it's really a wasteful process um, that uh, incurs a load on both sides of the request. And so, uh, live events kind of solves that, and let me, let me go into how that works. So when a user is interacting with Canvas, and let's say they create a group, Canvas is going to emit a live event to a service that we have created um, to deliver that live event, and it is a subscription-based service, much like a newspaper. Um, we all subscribe to newspapers, or at least we did at one point before mobile devices and they would get delivered uh, to our homes, right, because we're interested in that news. And so similarly, a third-party application can say, uh, hey, I'd like to subscribe to listen for uh, enrollment events, like enrollment created or enrollment updated events in the context of this course. And then when those events occurred in Canvas, as users were added to that context, uh, Canvas would emit those live events to our live event service, and then it would publish all of those out to the interested parties based on the subscription information that it had access to. So that's kind of how uh, the live event portion of the system works. So Caliper Analytics is a standard like LTI that is defined and managed by IMS. And uh, it does two things for us. It provides a standardized format uh, that we should shape our data in. And uh, that format is JSON, LD. They're using JSON LD to do that. Um, and so that's one benefit that it provides us because now everybody's talking kind of in the same um, format. So uh, interchanging data is really easy between systems. 
And then once we have that in place, the standard then defines how you can build analytic applications on top of that. Um, but you can also do other things with the live events that are coming out of Canvas, not just build analytic applications on top of it. Um, oh, and I should also mention that Caliper Live Events is in pre-release right now. Um, and the reason for that is because IMS is still finishing their specification and we want to get certified um, before we, uh, I guess, release it. Uh, so it's in pre-release right now while we wait for my IMS to do that and, and so we can get certified. Okay. To be clear, that's the caliper part, not the live events part. People are actively yeah. using live events. Sorry, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's the caliper part. Thanks, Brad. Um, okay, so the use case, or the case study that we're gonna go uh, over is kind of a uh, niche part of our platform that we created for our plagiarism detection partners. And so I kind of walk you through how that works for them. Um, so here we see part of the view for creating a new assignment. And currently, um, this only works if you uh, select an assignment type of online and then the file upload type. And then once you've selected that checkbox, this uh, plagiarism, can't see that. Plagiarism, excuse me, plagiarism review dropdown will show up and you can select a plagiarism partner from that dropdown. Once you do that, an LTI launch is gonna happen. So that content in the orange square below is content coming from the third party um, plagiarism detection provider. And probably in there, you would configure whatever you needed to for the assignment. So let's say you only wanted them to compare against submissions within that course, or maybe you want them to compare against everything on the web or whatever databases they have. That's where you, you would configure that, and then you would save the assignment. Once you click Save, Canvas is going to create a subscription for that third-party tool saying, um, uh, so this, this request goes to our live event delivery service and essentially it's saying, hey, I have a tool that's interested in listening for submission created and submission updated and assignment updated events. So anytime you see those, send it to this endpoint or send the live events to this endpoint. Okay, so then a student makes a submission. So what happens then? Canvas generates a submission created event and sends that to our live event delivery service and then the live event delivery service looks at its subscriptions and then delivers that live event out to the interested parties. Once those parties receive that, they can then make an API request back to Canvas um, to let Canvas know, hey, I've, I've received this live event and I'm gonna start work on the comparisons that I need to do for this submission. Now I should mention, this API request is special. And the reason it's special is because of the new LTI2 security improvements that uh, Brad was talking about. Uh, prior to this, um, with the OAuth1 standard and kind of the authentication flow that we go through to get API tokens, an LTI application could only make API requests on behalf of a user. But this request uh, is using an API token uh, that is on behalf of the LTI tool itself. So the, the tool itself is making the API request, which is really cool. And we're excited to kind of expand uh, the API endpoints and services that are available to LTI2 tools, because um, it's gonna make possible a lot of cool things. Um, so, okay, so this initial response back to Canvas is just saying, hey, I got the submission, I'm gonna start working on it. So then Canvas can uh, give a visual indication of that to the teacher, and that little clock there uh, means that uh, the third party service is currently reviewing the submission. So then once it's done performing that work, uh, then it can make another API request back to Canvas to say, hey, I'm done. And then this is what you see in the grade book, this little green bubble here. And that indicates to a teacher that uh, the originality report is available for review. And they can click on that. And when they do, up comes this modal and they can see the originality score there. But in addition, if they click on the originality score, it will actually launch to the third party plagiarism detection provider. And here, the provider could give the teacher a much more kind of immersive or deep analysis of kind of the originality, like why the originality score came out the way that it did and what things it's found and, and maybe allow teachers to disregard, you know, some of the, the content or the copied content that it, that it found. So um, this wouldn't be possible without the Caliper Live Event uh, platform. And so this is just kind of one example of how an application can leverage that to its advantage and provide a really cool experience for both students and teachers. 
but I'll turn it back over to Brad for Canvas data. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about Canvas data and how that's used. And um, we actually didn't have any really good examples of apps we had built internally at Instructure on Canvas data. Um, so, oh, we'll get there in just a sec. But basically, Canvas data um, is going to provide data in a, in a different format than we do for our other, um, the other tools that we've talked about today. Uh, the purpose of Canvas data is to give you the ability to do analytics and to um, understand and help provide data back to end users about how are we, um, you know, how are you doing? How are the things in your course working together? How are you comparing to the rest of the institution? You can use this at an administrative level. You can use this on a, on a per user level. Um, but it really gives you, starts to give you the kind of the broad feedback about, hey, what kind of trends do we see um, going on? To get at this kind of data without something like Canvas data would require many, many, many API calls. Um, it would require uh, waiting for lots of LTI launches with lots of data to come through. Um, and a lot of times then you'd be left with gaps in that coverage. And so in addition to that, this packages up in a really nice way that, uh, that is denormalized in a way that makes it ideal for analysis. So uh, Canvas data provides this kind of final tool right now that we're going to talk about in interacting with Canvas and pulling things out of Canvas. Um, so the kind of how this works is uh, every 24 to 36 hours, we have a process that goes through and sucks the data out of our tables in Canvas, uh, denormalizes it, and sticks it in CSV flat files. Um, those things get put in a storage place, S3, at Amazon, and it's in a shared place where we can put it and you can get it, and then you can pick it up and do whatever you want with it. And th this stuff can be consumed in a automated for in an automated way where you have some process that's pulling it and then sticking it into some visualizations for you. It could also be consumed like, I want the CSV, I'm gonna stick it in Excel. I don't know if they're big enough. I don't know if Excel will handle all sorts of these data sets, but um, you certainly could do some processing and start to poke around and see it. Um, CSV is a pretty simple format. So uh, that's the basics of Canvas data. Now I'm gonna talk about analytics for teaching and learning, and this is the case study we chose today. Um, wanted to give a thank you to the folks at U Utah State University who uh, have built all of this. Um, I kind of reached out and said, hey, is this something that we can show off at InstructureCon because this is a really cool use of Canvas data. Um, and I kind of grouped, so they have, a, they have a URL that you can hit and you can kind of look through some of these visualizations. I've captured most of them here. Um, but I kind of grouped them into three different sorts of visualizations. Um, the first one I wanted to show was student course interactions. So this is an example of using Canvas data now to pull out, hey, what are my students accessing in my course? Uh, I think it makes sense that in this example, uh, students most commonly access assignments. That's probably the thing that drives them the most. But you can kind of see, hey, how effective is other, other content types at driving that behavior? Um, they have a lot of breakdown of different types of content and what's the, um, what are the statistics around, around usage. And this is a further breakdown of some of that content. Uh, this is showing number of views for each individual piece of content in a course. Uh, this one I think is fun. This is assignment submissions <laughs> over the course of a week. So are we surprised? Um, <laughs> uh, course workload. So this is, you know, how does my, how does my assignments as they're set up in my course sum up to 100% as far as a grade's concerned. You can see it, can, yeah. You can see in this course that there are two large chunks of grade coming in on quizzes, probably some assessments, a midterm and a final maybe, um, and then a lot of kind of t over time assessment. Um, they also have done some analytics around instructor-student interactions. Um, so how is, it, how is a teacher interacting with their students in a course? You know, uh, announcements, they have, um, but I like the big one is, is submission comments. Students giving a lot of feedback to their students, trying to help them do better in their assignments. Um, so yeah, so assignment grading, how long, what's the time to grading on average for a, for a teacher um, to submission uh, for specific assignments and, and other data around that, so. Um, and then they also had some graphs about student performance. This is a simple one, what's the breakdown? But it's, it's pretty, right? It's a visualization and they're able to pull that out. Um, this could also now be done across larger contexts, whether the average grades in a department or whatever. Um, and then, you know, 
how else are our students doing? How often are their assignments late? How are their grades for specific assignments? Things like that. So um, a lot of really cool stuff. And these are just some examples of things that you can pull out of Canvas data. The, the, all of the data that we have in Canvas is at your fingertips when you're using this. Um, I just wanted to share a quote. This was just in our email thread. John Louvier from Utah State, I thought it was inspiring, so I wanted to share it. We're no longer just reacting to data. We are evolving to a proactive culture with staff and, fact, and faculty who are increasingly dependent on predictive and historical insights to do their jobs. And I think, I think that's awesome, uh, using, the, using the platform really to make um, our institutions better. Um, so with that, we're about out of time. But what are the tools for the job? Uh, here we have them. When do I use them? Well, I think you've seen through a lot of these case studies that a lot of times it's not just one tool. Um, you, you reach for the things that you need for your integration and for your, your customization. But you know, just as a summary, you know, API lets you kind of deeply integrate with Canvas. LTI lets you expose windows into third-party applications and, and really polish up UI elements. Um, live events lets you respond to changes and actions in Canvas. And Canvas data lets you kind of analyze aggregate data. So um, if, you want if you have any questions, if you want to look at some of our documentation, structure.github.io has a lot of links. Uh, we've just barely updated it with a lot of this new content. So we'd invite you to go there, take a look. And other than that, thanks for coming. <laughs> Question? So the question was, do we have any idea, idea when Canvas data might include outcome and rubric information? And we do not. We're representing the data team, unfortunately. We didn't do a lot of the work on the data product. Um, so I can't answer that. Apologize. Is there somewhere that you publish your new API at this point? Yeah, so the question, question was, is there somewhere that we publish our new API endpoints? And those can all be found at api.instructure.com. So, yeah. Oh, so like where we highlight what the new endpoints are. Um, I don't think we have a mechanism for that right that now. That is an excellent suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> we, we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, they're included in the release notes when we expose new APIs. So, sorry, can you repeat that? So, for lack of sense, are you using an existing protocol like AMDP, or uh, if you're not, do they do things like you know, like, do you the prior version? Um, yeah, so uh, the question was for live events, are we using an existing protocol, or are we doing something that we just created ourselves? And the question is, uh, we're doing something that we created ourselves. Uh, you do have a couple of options as far as the endpoints. Uh, where we deliver those to, uh, you can you can uh, you can use an SQS queue, in which case you could manage backups like that, um, and then also we we can post to an HTTPS endpoint. Um, but uh, really, our Caliper Live Event Framework is in its infancy, and I think it's only going to continue to grow and, and get better as we kind of discover where the pain points are and, and that kind of stuff. So. And I'd say specifically there, we, we encourage the use of the SQS queue where possible because it is a better boundary. Um, and in, in the case where you're an institution and you want to get like all events that are being issued for your institution, there's just such a fire hose that we're unwilling to, well, generally unwilling to uh, send all of those via HTTP. So those are generally, we're requiring SQS at this time. Um, we've looked into other things too, and so yeah, we're not closed as far as like those are the only ways we're gonna be delivering them in the future. The document, so where's the documentation for live events? Yeah. Um, so we're still waiting to publish that until we're out of pre-release. So we're just waiting on that yeah, certification with IMS. So another question here? Yeah. Um, so this is in, re in regard to Canvas data, right? Yeah, okay, so uh, the question was, what's the, f uh, I guess, uh, what do the snapshots look like for Canvas data? 
um, and they're full snapshots every 24 to 36 hours. So it's a, it's a complete, it's not a diff. You get a full snapshot, yeah. Uh, yes? So sorry, repeat that question again. Would it would it apply in that's not consuming event uh -huh. for say several hours or several days? Could you authenticate with cameras or would you need re-authenticate yourself? Um so so you so when when you subscribe for live events, so I mean if you're using SQS, then you're using Amazon permissions to access that data. If you're using HTTPS, um, you're gonna just provide us an authenticated endpoint to hit, and we'll just hit it. We're not worried about how long it's been or anything like that. So, yes. Is there any easy way uh, API access control to handle? Uh, you have a use case like uh, Spotify pool one has full, almost full API access with rebuild information. Um, so. The question was, basically it's around uh, scoping API tokens uh, to provide just a read-only kind of access token, right? Um, and I don't think that that's something that uh, we currently support, but it is something that is in the works. Like we're, we're, uh, like we're, we're currently looking at implementing uh, scoped API tokens, and it will be actually a lot richer than, than just that is our, is our hope. Um, so it's not something that we've begun work on yet. We're still planning the work on that because there's kind of a lot of pieces involved, but that is something that we're considering, but not something that, that, that we have access to. That being said, with LTI2 applications, we're starting to add APIs, and that, those APIs are very finely controlled. The permissions for those APIs are very finely controlled, where they can ask for very specific permissions, and that's all we'll give them access to. So with some of these new APIs that we're building, based on the LTI2 framework, we have that really granular security and controls about what that tool can access. So was there, yeah. What's the, uh, the API call limit? Is there a yeah. Code word right, yeah, uh, yes, there, so the question was, is there a point where API calls get throttled? Yes, there is. Um, so if you're making sequential calls with the same API token, you're not gonna run into that. Um, but if you're making parallel calls with the same token, you will. And uh, we use something called a leaky bucket algorithm. Um, so when you make the initial API request, um, there's a cost associated with that. And then each succeeding request fills up that bucket. And if you make too many requests in a short period of time, the bucket gets full and you'll start to get rate limited, right? So that, that just means that you need to slow down your API request to let that bucket leak out. And then you can continue making requests. So it's kind of like a fluid, like a, I can't tell you like a hard number, um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's how it's it like works. if you have 15, uh, agents all accessing the API at once, you'll run out of capacity really quickly. But you know, if you have like five or less, you'd probably be all right. It's just, it kind of depends on your usage patterns. And you are able to respond to that and, and the, the leaky bucket uh, empties pretty quickly. So like in five minutes or less, it's gonna be empty and ready. ready to go. So it's based on, it's based on time, uh, so execution. It, so, yeah, so that's like, probably your best indication. Like if this thing takes a really long time to execute, then it's calculating that as your cost. So. Yeah. There's, there's a pretty good article in the available tools that you can use. Uh, okay. So cool. yeah, you can you can search the community for uh, a little more information on that leaky bucket algorithm. Uh, I think Kara Fullwood posted on that the community. Okay. All right, any other questions? Yes. You mentioned up front if anybody had any ideas for additional API that could be used to add to the Amazon. Yeah. Um, that is a great question. I'd probably talk with your CSM. That, yeah, that would be, I think, the right channel to go through. Um, and then it would go through our normal kind of evaluation process and then get ticketed and, and scoped. So. All right. Thank you, you guys. <laughs>